Steve, tell me about the relation between how we think about individual action as philosophers and how we think about joint action on the other hand. Great question, Steve. Well, as you know, in the case of ordinary individual action, it's tempting to start from the philosopher Donald Davidson, who asks, what events in the life of a person reveal agency? What are his deeds and doings in contrast to the mere happenings in his history? What is the mark, says Davidson, that distinguishes his actions? What is the mark that distinguishes his actions? So although not every philosopher thinks that this is a good question to ask, of course philosophers even disagree about the questions, it's a question that guides a great deal of philosophy of action, so provides a reasonable anchor for us in starting to think there. I should say, by the way, as we're going through this quote, um, I'm from the 70s, but you're not, and so of course you won't use this uh, particular gender-specific language when you're expressing these questions, and in fact nor would I uh, these days, although back in the 70s that's how people generally wrote. So putting it simply, the question is which events are actions? And as we've seen, the standard way of thinking about this is to appeal to an intention. So the idea is that you've got some kind of event, and it stands in a special relation to an intention. You have to say what that relation is, of course. You have to say what intention is. And once you've done that, you've characterized actions. An action is an event that stands in an appropriate causal relation to an intention. The standard solution, very simple. So now the idea is, look, we ask the same question, but about joint actions. Which events are joint actions? But here we might say something different. Instead of contrasting joint actions with mere happenings, we might step it up a bit, following the example of Margaret Gilbert and Michael Bratman and say, what distinguishes the joint actions from things which are also actions and involve two agents, but involve those agents acting in parallel and merely individually. So there isn't any genuine joint action there. Canonical example is you and I walking down the street together because you've said to me, hey Steve, let's go for a walk. And I say, yes, that's great. Now this is a paradigm example of a joint action. It may also be that Aisha is walking side by side with us, but just because it's a crowded street and there's nowhere else for her to walk. So we're walking, the three of us <clears throat> in parallel, you and I jointly, Aisha and I are merely walking in parallel. There is no joint action there. What, says Bratman, what, asks Margaret Gilbert, is the difference. And the standard approach here is to look for the same structure. So we have the events that we want to characterize as joint actions. We suppose that they stand in some relation or other to a particular kind of state. And then we have those our joint actions. So the orthodox way to answer this question, the mainstream way, is to specify what the state is that stands in relation to the intention and to the event such that the event is a joint action. And usually the state or states in question are called shared intention, as we've seen. Now, all I want to say at this point, we're just introducing the question and the standard way of thinking about it, is that this way of thinking in the individual case is not mandatory. So likewise, in the joint case, we shouldn't think of it as mandatory, first point. Second point, we need to be very careful not to go in a circle here. Right? So if I say to you, which events are joint action, and you say to me, Steve, they're those events which are appropriately related to a shared intention. I now need to ask you the question, well, what is that shared intention? And it won't do you any good if you now say to me, Steve, a shared intention is the kind of state such that when an event's related to it, it's a joint action. Right? A shared intention is the kind of thing that we need to make events into joint actions. Here you've gone round in a circle, which is too tight to be terribly illuminating, and you know that because there's absolutely no way to raise an objection to the view that you have offered. You've created a view that could hardly be, uh, hardly be wrong, right? And maybe I'm exaggerating slightly, very hard to see how it's wrong. So that's the second point. If we're going to take this approach, then we need to give a substantive characterization of what shared intention is.